In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The story of Abraham is one of enormous risk and enormous grace. It lights a candle of possibility and shows us the flickering presence of divine providence. The kind of providence that assured Junin of Norwich that all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. Let's trace some of that amazing story, because in it we trace one of the basic laws working in our redemption. We learn a truth, a truth revealed to the psalmist who recognized, Thou, O Lord, maintainest my lot. The story seems to begin in the opening words of our first lesson. The Lord said to Abraham, leave your own country, your kin, and your father's house, and go to a country that I will show you. The call comes, but something is hidden within Abraham's life ex experience that, becomes, that comes before this fall, and sorry, before this calling, and enables him to recognize it is God who is speaking to him. And for that, we have to go back to a strange passage in the previous chapter that points out how Abram was already on the move. And so, in this, um, this what is happening now is only a further unfolding of God's plan for his life. Abram's father was Terah, and we are told that Terah took his son Abram and all his household, and they set out from Ur the Chaldees for Canaan. But when they reached Haran, they settled there. The passage is strange because no reason is given for why Terah either leaves Ur the Chaldees or desires to take his family to Canaan. But this decision, which is not put down to any divine calling, determines everything that follows for Abraham, who will eventually become Abraham when he seals a covenant with God, marking out his destiny to be the father of many nations, especially Israel. A destiny that will, in turn, become our destiny as children of God. Haran is not in Canaan. It's close to what is now the Syrian border in southern Turkey and one of the centers of the recent earthquakes. So Terah settled then, not having fulfilled his desire to go to Canaan. It is this desire that Abraham picks up on. And God speaks directly into this desire. For as our first lesson tells us, Abraham departed for Canaan and arrived there. It is in Canaan that the Lord opens the greatest chapter in Jewish and Christian redemption with vast consequences down through Western history. I am giving you this land for your descendants. And then Abraham begins his traversal of this land, journeying by stages towards the Negev and into the wilderness. And if this was the land of divine promise, the very terrestrial content spoken of by God, then as Abraham journeys into Negev and our passage continues, the land was stricken by a severe famine. Let's pull out now from that past 
and get at what is the principle. That basic law working in and through our redemption and indeed the redemption of the world. Here is where this morning's reading from Paul's letter to the Romans comes in. For Paul emphasizes Abraham as the bearer of a promise. It is because he stands faithful by what God has promised, even before coming into the Jewish law, which doesn't come to Moses, that God counts him righteous. He is, if you like, made to live, made to live by faith. He may have received from God the knowledge that the land within which he journeys, his descendants will occupy as theirs. But if he turned to face the brutal facts, one, he had no children, and Sarah, his wife, is old and unable now to conceive. And two, the land's a wilderness. It's devastated by famine. There is no lush garden of delights flow with milk and wine, dripping with honey and the juice of pomegranates. But Abraham sealed up that promise in his heart, as later Mary will seal up in her heart the promise of the incarnation of God. So as Paul reminds us, what is written about Abraham is not for his sake alone, it's also for ours. And what is it to live by promise? Paul tells us that this is a way of living in which everything, everything is according to grace. In fact, some translations will drive that point home with phrases like, that it might be a matter of sheer grace. Sheer grace. Abraham can do nothing to affect or realize this promise. Its fulfillment lies utterly with God and the dispension of loving kindness. The hidden work of divine providence bringing all things to perfection and their true end. It is this confidence of God working towards the redemption of all things in which our own redemption rests. It is this confidence that enables Julian of Norwich to make that astonishing claim. All shall be well and all manner of things shall be well. It was astonishing in our own time in which the black death raged. The crown was violently handling what we call the, pre the peasants' revolt. And the church was persecuting a group demanding institutional reform known as the Lollards. It was astonishing personally for her, a woman with a vocation in a church that rarely recognized women and those with revelations were viewed as misfits. Julian's own writings were banned and suppressed. Her claim is just as astonishing today. It makes absolutely little sense on the surface of things, with economic insecurity, increasing levels of poverty, global disasters through climate change, war on the very doorstep of Europe and tensions in the Pacific. If we just looked at the actual facts of what we see around us, then it's no wonder scenarios of, of the future are apocalyptic and doubts are raised as to whether humankind as we know it will survive beyond the end of this century. But this is exactly where the promise and being faithful to the promise kicks in. We live to cite Paul in the same letter to the Romans in a hope that is beyond hope. 
is not a hope then that's based in human optimism or human pessimism. It's a hope based in a work of redemption that is in God's hands. As with the rabbi's child in the gospel reading, it is the dead who are raised to life in Christ. It is the impossible that God performs. And that is not easy. Living on promise is not easy. It exposes us because we like to be in control. In the West, we've grown up on the illusions of our freedom to choose, to decide. Our autonomy is a fiction. And this raises hard questions that are not for this morning. For this morning, it is enough to understand that we live by sheer grace. And that makes us feel very vulnerable. We will never be able to redeem ourselves. But however crazy it sounds, it is in our very vulnerability that God can affect the salvation which by faith, by promise, we embrace. Salvation is the work of love within and upon us, the propulsion to love and to be loved. That work will whittle the form and meaning of our lives. So the key question this morning is, do you trust God loves you? Because this side of eternity, in that alone, lies our true rest. Amen.